Uh, moving on now, and speaking of the glorification of the church, uh, we cover, as you know, from time to time, uh, some controversial uh, things going on in the church. One of them being the absolute meltdown of the Church of Nice. Now, we know lots of people in the Church of Nice, the establishment church, don't like that expression. But it is a very true expression because it represents exactly what's going on. But there is this dark side to the Church of Nice, and uh, we sort of call it the Church of Ugly. And we're seeing an example of that right now in the Archdiocese of New York. Now, uh, we did a vortex last week showing some of the major parish shutdowns in various big archdioceses all over the country, and it's it's astounding. Even here in Detroit, we had this, uh, uh, the Archbishop of Detroit, Alan Vigneron, a couple of weeks ago held a press conference, and in this press conference, uh, he admitted that, uh, you know, there was this massive meltdown, a 50% reduction in the sacramental life here in the Archdiocese of Detroit uh, over the space of just 13 years, a 50% reduction. I mean, that's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. So we went on to talk about uh, how that, uh, how the meltdown of the establishment church is happening all over the United States. One of the places we talked about was the Archdiocese of New York. And New York, now the list hasn't been finalized in the sense of made public yet, but the Archdiocese of Detroit, from everything we can gather from inside uh, sources in the uh, uh, in the New York Archdiocese, is that they are just about ready to come public with closing somewhere between 50 and 70 parishes, just shutting them down. And the problem with this is, how do you determine which ones? Can some politics enter in? How about some particular uh, ways of uh, wanting to squelch some enemies, if you consider them enemies. Sure, all this stuff enters into it. Of course it does. And the big problem is that there is one particular church in New York, in Manhattan, and that church in Manhattan is Holy Innocence. Now, Holy Innocence has, uh, uh, it's sort of right in the heart of Manhattan, has been a very well-known church for a number of years now because it has been sort of uh, the mainstay of the traditional Latin mass community. It really is the the only uh, church uh, that, well, St. Agnes is over by uh, Grand Central has uh, traditional Latin Mass also. My parents, God rest my mother, uh, used to go to that Mass. But uh, Holy Innocence is a tremendous church. It's got a wonderful faithful faith community there, uh, very, very dedicated to the church's traditional teachings, traditional Latin Mass, everything you could name. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, it becomes known that Holy Innocence is right at the top or near the top of the parish hit list of all the parishes, of all the parishes that you would want to want to target to close. Why on earth would a parish that has a faithful community there that had raised money to upgrade and, and redecorate, I and mean, it was a pretty expensive drive, too. They, I mean, they did all sorts of things. When not too very far down the road at St. Francis Xavier uh, Church, we're going to show you a picture here. What goes on there? It's a celebration of the homosexual lifestyle, the nonstop celebration of the homosexual lifestyle. There, you're seeing a picture here of the, uh, the, a runner, a gay flag runner, uh, going right into the sanctuary. And is that church being targeted? Oh, no, 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 no. Some things are just, you know, too sacrosanct. We can't do that. Um, but, yeah, Holy Innocence Church, as you can see here, this next picture we have up, um, you know, this gets targeted. And there are vocations coming out of there. There are all kinds of... It is a vibrant, small, but vibrant and growing Catholic community. Why on earth would Cardinal Dolan or himself or his the people he's appointed, put a church like this on the front of it. Well, on the front of their hit list, the top of their list. Well, this came out, and uh, the uh, priest there, Father Wiley, uh, gave a homily. And this homily has become the subject of a firestorm on the Internet. And uh, he essentially said, stand fast, you know, faithful, traditional Catholics, stand fast. Uh, you know, this is a cross you're going to have to carry, etc., like that. But you need to, you know, what happens to you? And he raised all these questions that uh, that many uh, many traditional-minded Catholics, faithful Catholics, have been asking for years. Why is it that they're always the ones targeted? And you got to remember this, folks. Again, when you're putting together a list, the cardinal gets to pick. This parish closes. This parish stays open. These parishes cluster. Why? Would you leave untouched a number of parishes that are openly celebrating of the homosexual lifestyle, uh, you know, flying under the cover of LGBT ministries, we all know what that means, 
and just put the clamps on a parish uh, that wants to promote traditional Catholicism? Uh, it's a big question, and it was a question that Father Wiley raised in his homily uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, and he has been sent packing so much for the Church of Nice and Tolerance and Non-Judgmentalism. Huh? Well, standing by with us right now is a friend of Father Wiley's, Father Paul, or sorry, Paul Greger, friend of Father, uh, Father Wiley's. Paul, how are you? I'm fine. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, let me ask you that question. Do you think that there is this, I don't know if you say it's targeting, or, uh, but why is it that, you know, at the end of the day, it's always the small little faithful traditional Latin mass Catholics that are always the left ones holding the bag and getting the pink slip? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to say how honored I am actually to be referred to as a friend of Father Wiley. It is a great honor to be his friend. And I was in the Church of Holy Innocence um, at the Sunday Mass when he pronounced that homily. And I was, quite, I was quite horrified, actually, when I heard of the reprisals that he'd suffered. Um, but really, I, I began to wonder, what planet do these people in the Archdiocese live on? You know, if I were more blessed with the theological virtue of charity, I, I may, may even be tempted to feel sorry for them. <laughs> you know, they talk about wanting to make all things new, and they want to make sure that the church gets with the times. But, you know, hello, you know, wake up and smell the incense. If in today's world you try to silence one voice, thousands will echo that voice over the internet. Yeah, it, there, know, there, does, there seems to be this major disconnect. You know, you know look, church and nice, Here's, here's a rule you need to understand. You know, the game has changed. You don't get to issue edicts from on high and smother groups of people. This technology right here has done an end run around you. You think you're going to sit here and abuse this priest, this priest who is a faithful, solid Catholic priest. You think you're going to be able to use your old game, your old rules. Game's changed, guys. Tell us a little bit about Father Wiley, Paul. Um, well, I, uh, I've been uh, attending the Mass at Holy Innocence for about five years, and I've had the privilege of actually serving Mass with Father Wiley. You know, sometimes you go to Mass and, uh, you know, you listen to the homily, or at least I listen to the homily, and I go out thinking, you know, why didn't I just take out a subscription to the New York Times, you know, <laughs> um, instead of putting money in the, in the donation plate to listen to secular, to secular dogmas, you know. However, when I listen to Father Wiley, I really feel that he is bolstering my faith. He is telling us that the faith has a solid intellectual basis in line with Pope Benedict's teachings on faith and reason. So I come out of uh, Holy Innocence after having attended uh, Mass and having listened to Father Wiley with a stronger faith and a stronger conviction that whatever the hierarchy tries to do to Father Wiley, they will not be victorious. You know, they can persecute one man, but what they've done, in fact, is given us, you know, they've created a hero figure, you know, for thousands of people who, who admire him and uh, agree with what, he's, you know, what he says. And I really wonder, you know, is the director of communications not back from spring break, you know? Do they not have <laughs> internet access in the archdiocesan offices? You know. They've clearly demonstrated, they've clearly demonstrated over the years that they can't run a church. Otherwise, they wouldn't be closing dozens of them in Manhattan alone. Yeah, yeah dozens. And, and let's, not, let's not forget, that's on top of what was it, 27 closings just two or three years ago. I mean, if you go the last 10 years, they have shut down or will have shut down. Probably the number isn't definitively set yet, at least been released. But you're talking about in the last 10 years, 100 parishes in the Archdiocese of Detroit. That is major, major contraction. And so what does this talk to? This talks to the incompetence of these people. And now they even screw up at what they've been practicing for decades, and that's silencing good priests who, who have the courage to teach the truths of our Catholic faith. Are you at all troubled, Paul? I think I know the answer to this. This is what we call in the business a softball question. <laughs> Paul, are you troubled at all that holy innocence would be uh, you know, at the top or near the top of this parish hit list while a parish like St. Francis Xavier that, that is notorious. You cannot be a Catholic in Manhattan and not know about the whole pro-gay agenda of, of, uh, of St. Francis Xavier Church there on 31st Street. I mean, it's ridiculous. Do, but are you troubled by that? 
I'm, I'm immensely troubled at the idea that um, people who are priests, bishops, archbishops, whatever, can close down a church that is providing spiritual succor to hundreds and thousands of people. I won't comment on other churches because I, I, I only go to Holy Innocence. I go there as often as I can th uh, during the week to the 6 p.m. traditional mass if my work schedule allows me, and I go there on Sundays at 10.30 where I have the honor of, of serving mass. So I'm troubled, and I'm also troubled really for the souls of the people who are making these decisions because at the end of the day, they'll have to answer for that decision. When when Pope Benedict released the uh, his motu proprio, uh, uh, you know, revivifying the Latin Mass around the world, uh, a number of uh, bishops went on record. A number of uh, luminaries at the Vatican went on record and said they were shocked at the resistance of the bishops around the world, the Western world, to want to even consider. Uh, uh, you know, welcoming uh, and being gregarious towards the uh, towards the Latin Mass, they couldn't believe it. And the more and more you talk to bishops and and uh, and you know, chancery types, chancery rats, the more you talk to them, the more you see this massive resistance to anything that speaks of tradition. Now you can get down into the nitty gritty of a textbook or something, and people have to go hunting for it. But you bring out a Latin mass, you know, I said ad orientum, of course, and people are kneeling to receive Holy Communion on the tongue, and this is an anathema to the Church of Nice. Why does the establishment church of the today have such a feeling of animosity toward? anything that speaks of tradition, and certainly the, the Latin Mass, the traditional Latin Mass, because it's right there in front of your face. Why are they so, you know, why is this bee in their bonnet? Um, I, obviously, you should ask them. Um, frankly, I feel sorry for them. I know what the Latin, traditional Latin Mass brings to me in terms of uh, spiritual nourishment. Um, it's quite unfortunate. And um, I think actually the results are quite clear in terms of the effect that this has. You spoke yourself about the massive reduction in church attendance. Now, is it not strange that for 1500 years we were celebrating the traditional Latin mass and hundreds of churches were built in the, in the 19th century um, by the same architect who built Holy Innocence and those churches were filled. Now we've been experimenting with a new liturgy over the last 50 years. You do not have to be a rocket scientist <laughs> to draw some conclusions. You know, if, if they were managing the Yankees, you know, and they, they, they brought on a, a, a trainer who was not capable of winning games, they tr they, they'd throw out the trainer and they'd rethink the, their batting strategy. Well, they'd have I riots in the Bronx. <laughs> maybe the hierarchy, maybe the hierarchy of the Catholic Church should uh, review also its strategy. Yeah, it is. It's it's. It's beyond disturbing. You know, we've reported on these things for a number of years. Many other people have reported many more years uh, than we have on it. We have the advantage of having, you know, television. So it's sometimes in this day and age, it's a better form of communication, getting the message across. But the idea that there is just this, this radical animosity towards anything of tradition. Uh, you know, even, even a, <laughs> I mean, all of this stuff came out. Uh, you know, Cardinal Dolan went to uh, uh, St. Francis Xavier Parish three years ago. The parish videotaped the event. It was the, uh, they just spent $10 million fixing it all up, uh, and they invited him to come say the Mass. He's at the Mass. Many of our viewers may not remember this or may not know it, but he goes to the Mass, and at the Mass, uh, in the middle of Mass, they start bringing up all the different parish groups, you know, the Alcoholics Anonymous and this and that. And those are all fine works, you know, and all this stuff. You know, it's, you know, people need help, and that's wonderful. Uh, then they brought up and introduced to him the LGBT group and said the parish lesbian and gay group. And they brought him up, and he sat there in the chair he had his glasses in his hand like this. He was slouched over. We got the video. He leans over. They make the announcement, and he goes like this. He goes like that, gives them the big handshake, big cheer. Turn to the sacraments and find 
an adult place in the church of their youth. I invite them and all those who support this ministry to stand. Can you imagine St. Athanasius, <laughs> Bishop Sheen, who's buried under the cathedral, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, standing there and giving a little cheer to people who have perverted sex and are placing their immortal souls in danger? In, in, in danger? It's mind-boggling how far off the tracks the, 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 the Church of Nice, the Establishment Church, has gone. It's beyond the pale. Absolutely. And, um, you know, this, this entire incompetence and, and irresponsibility, you know, it wouldn't be so perilous, uh, you know, for, for souls, except for the fact that we're living in this, as you say, this toxic environment. You know, there are almost as many abortions in the city of New York as there are live births. We're witnessing state-sponsored attack on the family and the federal government trying to get involved in all aspects of our personal lives, including, you know, the education of, of our children. Where is the church? Where is the hierarchy? They're missing in action. No, Paul, they're missing no, no, in no, action. Paul, they're not missing in action at all. You know, we've got to pass immigration reform. It is the most pressing issue. We have got to pass immigration reform. We've got to make sure that health care is right in place. You know, these are important issues. I'm a European, so I can't, can't, I can't comment on, uh, on immigration reform. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, we're out of time, but I wanted to say thank you very much for being on. Thank you for giving us the update. Could, Please. could, we end, could I end with, a, with a, a prayer that we're reciting every evening? You should know your listeners may be interested in this. You go right you ahead. Know, every, every, every evening after the 6 p.m. Mass in Holy Innocence, we uh, are praying that the, um, that the Archdiocese does not close down our church. And it's a prayer to uh, St. Michael. Now, those listeners who went to Catholic school might have to Google that. I said, St. Michael the Archangel. And the prayer goes as follows. O glorious Prince of the Heavenly Host, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. These crafty enemies of mankind have filled to overflowing with gall and wormwood the church, which is the bride of the spotless lamb. They have lain profane hands upon her most sacred treasures. Make haste, therefore, O invincible Prince, to help the people of God against the inroads of the lost spirits and grant us victory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Paul, for being with us. We will keep, Pleasure. We will keep you and all the parishioners uh, in our prayers here and ask our viewers to do the same. Please extend our hellos to, uh, to Father Wiley and to uh, anybody there at Holy Innocence who uh, uh, needs to hear that there's people on their side and we're trying to spread the word. I should certainly do that, and thank you very much indeed for all your support.